biome, zonation, and succession. Uh, so climate is going to be the major determinant in the type of biome that you have in a given area. Um, and then ecosystems will vary due to local abiotic and biotic factors. Uh, but biomes are kind of our broad categories um, for different types of environments. So of course, tropical rainforests and temperate rainforests compared to um, seasonal forests, which might lose their leaves. Boreal forests, uh, like up in the Arctic, and then tundra once we're above tree line. And of course, deserts, as we're familiar with here, um, and grasslands as well. Um, succession is going to be the change in ecosystems over time. And eventually, succession will lead to what are called climax communities. These tend to be more stable states, uh, sort of like equilibrium for the equals ecosystem. Um, and they tend to be a lot more resilient once you get there. Um, so stability, succession, and biodiversity are all linked together. So our most stable ecosystems will be the most biodiverse and they'll be at the later stages of, uh, of succession. Um, and you can kind of see how the abundance of different uh, materials changes over time. You know, we lose all the available bare rock and eventually we get more mosses and grasses and woody plants until eventually we have a climax forest um, with a combination of other, other factors as well. Um, so biomes are collections of ecosystems with similar climatic conditions. Our major classes include aquatic or water-based forests, grasslands, deserts, and tundra. Um, they all have characteristic limiting factors, like in the desert, water is a limiting factor. In the tundra, insulation and temperature is a limiting factor. Um, they'll have different levels of productivity and different levels of biodiversity. Um, so here's a, a spread out of different terrestrial biomes. Terrestrial are land-based. Uh, terra comes from, I believe it's the Latin um, for Earth. And you can see these are actually even more descriptive than the um, biomes we saw on the last page. So kind of making uh, regional distinctions too. Um, cool. And so we could have aquatic or water-based biomes. We could have forests, grasslands, of course, deserts, and tundra, basically areas above tree line. Um, and so we can look at different factors um, equated with those biomes. You don't necessarily have to memorize all of this information, though you should know um, in general how a forest differs from a grassland, differs from a desert, et cetera, um, and how productivity of deserts is so much lower than areas like forests, areas like coral reefs. And consequently, biodiversity might be very different in these places as well. Um, so the big factors that govern the distribution of biomes are gonna be insulation or sunlight, precipitation and rain and temperature as well. Um, so insulation is gonna play a huge role in temperature as we can see here where you have the most direct insulation, we get the warmest temperatures and that's why we have the tropical zone. The areas with the least direct insulation, you'll see the sun's at an angle here. Those are our polar zones, which would be the coldest polar referring to the poles. And then temperate is sort of like uh, intermediary, kind of medium, um, moderate levels of temperature. Um, and then you can kind of see how um, different levels of uh, precipitation match with uh, evapotransportation, um, basically water coming from plants. And then you have your super humid areas with your super arid areas. And then your um, kind of temperature, um, temperature ranges, right? Tropical, super warm to polar, super cold. Um, so the tricellular model, this is basically why we have different biomes in different areas. Uh, you don't need to memorize the names of these different types of cells, um, but you should know that um, this type of circulation is why we have lots of um, evaporation at the equator and all this evaporating water actually turns into precipitation. So we get lots of rain right along this belt. And if you know what's over here, you'd be like, oh, that's the Amazon rainforest. And maybe if you know anything about Africa, you'd be like, oh, there's a huge rainforest there in Central Africa. Um, so areas with low pressure where the air moves upwards, that's where you're gonna have lots of rain. Areas of high pressure where the air pushes downwards, that's gonna be the opposite. Um, so we can see here at 30 degrees north and 30 degrees south latitude, 
um, the air actually pushes down. So that's gonna be low precipitation. And we actually see a desert here, the Namibian desert at about 30 degrees latitude. The outback in Australia is about the same latitude. The Saharan desert is at about 30 degrees north. And actually our deserts in the Southwest are also at the same latitude. So that high pressure system creates deserts, the low pressure will create rainforests and wetter environments. Um, so climate change might affect the shift of biomes. Um, generally places might tend to get drier and warmer, though some places actually could get a little bit wetter as well. Um, zonation is gonna be the change of communities along an environmental gradient due to different factors like altitude or elevation, latitude or how far north and south, um, different tidal levels, which we see in this picture here, um, or distance from the shore, how covered by water you are. Um, so here we see animals that live in the um, areas which are basically underwater all the time versus animals which live in tidal zones. So this might be submerged sometimes and then um, unsubmerged at other times. Um, and again, you can see a different uh, example on the side of a mountain. As you go up in elevation, um, you get uh, colder temperatures, maybe changes in precipitation. Um, so these colder temperatures is actually almost like driving northwards too, right? We could start down in Phoenix. And if you drive north uh, into Montana, you'd get some nice boreal forests. And then up into Canada, it would be mostly trees like this. And then if you get up into the Arctic, all of a sudden there'll be no more trees. And then at the North Pole, it will be only snow and ice. Same thing on the mountain. As you climb the mountain, you go through those same types of zones, which is where the word zonation comes from. Succession is gonna be temporal change, change over time through pioneer, intermediate and climax communities. So those climax communities have um, a lot of diversity and really rich, deep soils, um, but they can be affected by disturbance. In this case, the disturbance looks like it was a forest fire. You can see all the darkened trees, all the vegetation is gone. Um, so when the forest fire comes through, it clears out all this land so new pioneer species can move in. These are our selected rapid reproducers um, that spread very quickly. Um, and as they spread, they kind of alter the composition of the soil. They create shadier areas for um, plants that are um, kind of less adapted to, to open environments. Uh, and then eventually your climax community will return. Um, the patterns of energy flow and, and everything will kind of change over time. Um, but you can see how stability will increase um, as succession goes through. Um, so, you know, these, these plants, as they regrow the forest, will create a more stable ecosystem over time. Um, greater habitat diversity leads to greater species and genetic diversity. This um, is actually pretty, pretty intuitive. If you think about it, habitat diversity is all the different places that you could live. So if there's more places to live, there's better opportunity for more species. Um, more environmental variation leads to more niches, leads to more species. And if you have more species, you might also have more genetic diversity as well. Um, and those species will have different strategies for reproducing. Um, some of them are adapted for pioneer type communities. Some of them are adapted for climax communities. Our rapid reproducers have a lot of characteristics that allow them to spread very quickly. Where the K strategists, the climax community, the carrying capacity, they'll have other adaptations which um, allow them to live in those more stable environments. And again, this is a spectrum. Um, some species might not be perfectly fit into one versus the other. You might have very extreme case strategists where they have very few offspring over a very long period of time. You might have very extreme R strategists where they have many, many, many offspring in a short amount of time. Um, and then they also kind of match different, uh, different curves, basically. Um, so we see our R selected species, the rapid reproducers rapidly go past carrying capacity and then they will drop right back down below it. And then they'll rapidly shoot up again and then drop down below and see you see lots of dramatic variations in these types of species versus the K selected species which actually slow down their reproduction rates so they can exist pretty close to carrying capacity without seeing really dramatic fluctuations. Um, and then these also have different survivorship curves. We haven't talked too much about those, um, but you could kind of 
uh, sort of intuit that, right? So uh, animals like fish lay lots and lots of eggs, but most of those eggs die right away, um, where few fish make it to old age. Uh, whereas animals like humans, very few humans die at a young age, thankfully. Most humans tend to die at an older age. Um, so you can see here the number of survivors um, as the lifespan goes on. Um, this would be younger over here and older over here. You can see not many old survivors for um, animals like fish and bugs and invertebrates. Lots of old survivors for animals like humans and other case selected species. Um, so as we move through succession, the amounts of productivity will change. As you might guess, um, productivity is going to be really low in early succession because there's not really a lot of stuff there. You might only have moss and lichen growing on the grass, uh, sorry, growing on the ground. Um, but as you move through over time, you'll increase the amount of productivity. Um, and then really the complexity of the ecosystem will increase its stability um, the more pathways for nutrients will, will create even more resiliency. Um, you could imagine if this was only one individual at each level, if you took away that one individual, it might destroy the whole food web, whereas lots of other uh, organisms can create a more robust food web, more susceptible or less susceptible to change. Um, the, the concept of climax community is, is actually a little bit antiquated. Now they kind of recognize the role of disturbance in continuing to allow ecosystems to change and evolve. Um, and they actually think that things like forest fires are really important in keeping ecosystems really diverse. Um, so you can kind of see different patches of forest here um, based on the tree type. Um, we also can see this um, in Flagstaff in Colorado. Um, these yellow trees are likely aspens. Aspens move into areas that were recently disturbed. Um, so if you see a big yellow patch, maybe there was a landslide there, maybe there was a forest fire, and all the aspens have moved in to take over. So actually adding to, to some diversity. Um, human activity, of course, can affect all aspects of the environment. Um, and we actually could create, um, create stages for succession, right, if we use fire, um, either intentionally or unintentionally. Um, or if we, you know, degrade the resource somehow, like if we dig a big hole in the ground for mud pit, we've actually established uh, a, a secondary succession site. Um, ecosystems ability to survive really relies on its resilience and its diversity. Um, so if you have a, a really diverse and resilient ecosystem, it can recover pretty quickly. Um, however, some ecosystems uh, like rainforests are less able to recover than others. Uh, so example style questions, how does distribution structure biodiversity and relative productivity contrast between different biomes? So where do you see deserts? Where do you see rainforests? How are they structured differently? Where can you live in them, et cetera? You might be asked to analyze data for different biomes. So why do we see different flora and fauna in these, in these areas based on the average temperature? So why do you see a polar bear in the cold areas, but you see camels in the hot areas? Um, discuss the impact of climate change on biomes. So how does climate affect where you might find deserts or where you might find rainforests, et cetera? Describe the process of succession. So here we see um, the initial stages of primary succession. And as um, plants and moss and other things come in, they start to break down the soil. Eventually that soil becomes deeper and flowers and stuff start to grow. Um, and once those flowers grow, they really help to develop the soil um, and create opportunities for even more growth. Um, all the rest of this stuff we actually get to cover next year when we talk about agriculture, soil horizons, that type of stuff. But um, And then communities, how they change through succession. So starting with really basic communities with not a lot of organisms, lots of pioneer species, lots of our selected to those really stable climax communities. Um, and then of course you can find the link to this slideshow in the description here.